All right, Dr. Rita Belazer, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. And we've already had such a great one before I even hit record all around kind of how we can work together. And I'll be honest with you, hemorrhoids and fissures are something that I think no one would ever think of seeing a physio for. I think it's, uh, this is my kind of assessment of it is most people like I need to get a cream. And if the cream doesn't work, then I need to go see a surgeon and I need to have a surgery to mm -hmm. deal with my hemorrhoids. And so I, um, I think in the, in the past, we would never thought of anything a little bit more conservative than that. So I'm really looking forward to helping people understand a little bit more how we might work together as physio and surgeon. So I have enjoyed kind of not only getting to know you in this short amount of time, but looking at some of the information that you're putting out on, for example, social media. And I listen to you and I think, wow, this is someone that's looking at the big picture and, and really kind of interested in her patients and helping them understand. Will you introduce yourself so that everybody else listening knows a little bit about you, Rita? Yes, ma'am. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I'm excited to have our conversation. So yes, my name is Dr. Rita Belazare. I am a board certified colorectal surgeon in the United States. My practice is in Houston, Texas. Um, I have my own um, solo private practice. I take care of patients with all sorts of colorectal um, disorders, um, including anything involving the anus and the rectum and the pelvic floor. And so it wasn't really until I kind of opened my own practice last July, um, where I started getting more involved in um, pelvic floor colorectal related um, issues that I started forming relationships with pelvic floor physical therapists and really learning that this was like a, a multidisciplinary issue that we're dealing with. I do know the surgeries that are required to take care of these when they get to that point, but I have found that a lot of people um, are not interested in these types of operations because they can be painful. So knowing that there are several steps beforehand that can get them there to help relieve their symptoms and potentially averting surgery altogether, you know, that that's been um, a lot of growth for me. So, um, so yeah, so my practice very much involves very closely dealing with and referring to and taking care of patients from uh, physical uh, pelvic floor physical therapists. I'm so interested to hear like, I'm, I'm way up in Western Canada. How yeah. in Texas did you hear about this podcast? Yeah, so actually, it wasn't until I met one of the pelvic. So, when I started getting interested in colorectal uh, related um, pelvic floor disorders, I was like, you know what, I should reach out to some of the pelvic floor physical therapists because I know we're seeing a lot of the same patients. And so I just kind of in my mission to honestly market myself, it was probably a little bit selfish and learn more. I have made relationships with some amazing people and pelvic floor physical therapists. The first thing that I will say that I noticed almost globally is how much they really care about these patients, <laughs> spend a lot of time with them, know so much more about them and like how you guys are just in a situation where you want to help them, but like you also want to have people that you can refer them to. So one of my meetings with the pelvic floor physical therapist, she was telling me about this conference that had happened back in the fall. I believe it was in Atlanta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And the con. Yeah. The con. yeah. And she was talking a lot about all the people she met. She had like the booklet and everything. She was showing me all these things. And then we started talking about podcasts where I could learn more. And that's where your podcast came up. Cool. And so I was, I subscribed to, you know, a few of the podcasts that she told me about, and that's how I learned about you. And that's what prompted me to reach out. So I'm so curious to know, like why the shift from what you were doing before to your private practice, because I'm I'm wondering if before we hit record, you were talking all about how I really love having more time with people now. And I'll keep in mind, like our healthcare system is a bit different in Canada. Like not all practitioners have that ability to work in a different setting. But was there something about the setting you were working in before that maybe you can notice the difference now in in where you are presently? Yeah. So the system I was working in before um, was actually one of our county hospitals and I still work there actually part-time, but it's um, 
typically services um, patients, um, low-income patients. Um, so in the United States, if you don't have insurance or you don't have the means to get insurance, you essentially have to pay out of pocket for all of your medical care, which is very, very expensive. So in Harris County, which is where Houston is located, there is an entire hospital system called the Harris Health System. And patients qualify for a certain type of insurance where they can get care at any one of those facilities. Um, so that um, that is where I worked full-time now I'm there part-time. So the system is really um, busy, very, very busy and overcrowded. And so when I would see patients in clinic um, between, you know, two board certified surgeons and a handful of residents, we would be seeing anywhere between like 60 to 80 patients in a day. Wow. And so in that situation, you just you don't have time, you know, I, and I would, and this would be like, even like a new cancer patient, you would only have like five minutes with them. And so I didn't, I didn't have the heart to like do spend five minutes with a cancer patient. So, and then ultimately like it's two hours later and patients are still in the waiting room, you know, so it, there's, it was kind of a no win. You either just rush through or you back up the clinic. Right. And so in patients that had things that were not cancer or that weren't like actively trying to kill them like a fissure or a hemorrhoid little things you spend literally like sometimes 90 seconds two minutes in a room with them right and um that is not the reason why i left that's why i'm still part-time there because i still love serving that population of people but in your own practice you can decide how many patients you see of course you have to see enough to be able to like keep your lights on and keep your practice open but I can decide how long I want to spend with patients. And because my practice is still new and I'm still building the practice, if a patient comes in, they have a 1 p.m. appointment, even if it's slotted for only a 15 minute appointment, but I have nothing else going on afterwards, I'll just sit and talk and get to know them and spend time. And a lot of times it unroofs a lot of other issues that are really not, you know, we start talking about their hemorrhoid and we leave, you know, talking about something completely different that's really bothering them. So, um, so I, I love that about having my own practice, that I get to decide how much time I spend with people. And usually it's a lot of time. Um, but at the same time, you know, I kind of understand why we often don't have that kind of time to spend in other settings. Yeah, I think that segues nicely to kind of like, so our topic today is all about like hemorrhoids and fissures. And we were talking before we hit record how and you mentioned too, that um, we really are interested in our patients, but that's partly because we have time. And I think that, I think that maybe one of the differences, not to put words in your mouth, but you know, what you're saying is like in, in some of the hospital settings or the public settings, they have hemorrhoids. Whereas now you're starting to, and this is the way I think we've learned to practice is, okay, why does this person have hemorrhoids? Like it's yeah. more of like an upstream. Okay. I have to figure out why is this the output? Like, why is that? Yeah. Why are they getting this? And I think that's what you're kind of saying yes. is that you have more time for that. And so let's unpackage this topic. So Let's picture, um, I always say, I picture the patient that is listening to this and I know care providers listen too, but let's say I'm going to be sharing this with people that have hemorrhoids or anal fissures. And so I think it'd be a really good starting point to just explain like, how do you describe hemorrhoids to your patients when they, when they come in with this discomfort? How do you describe what a hemorrhoid is? Sure. So the first thing I say is that hemorrhoids are actually a normal part of our anatomy. We are all born with them and it's part of our continence mechanism. So meaning, you know, when you have that urge to have a bowel movement, but you're able to kind of keep it in until you go, you make it to the toilet. The hemorrhoids are part of that. Con it's not the entire part of it, but it's part of that continence mechanism. So the day you were born, you have hemorrhoids. It's just a matter of if they get swollen that's when they start causing problems like bleeding and pain. Those are the most um, common ones, sometimes itching. Um, so essentially what it is, is it's a cushion of tissue and inside of those cushions are little blood vessels. <clears throat> and um, when they get enlarged, when the hemorrhoid gets enlarged, and we can talk a little bit down the line, what causes that, but when the hemorrhoid gets enlarged, and let's say you pass like a large bowel movement or a firm bowel movement, it irritates that large cushion, which has the blood vessel in it. So that bleeds transiently or for a short period of time. And even a tiny amount of blood can look like 
you know, scary in the toilet bowl, but that's why they bleed. Um, and then, you know, once it kind of, um, you know, um, shrinks back down momentarily, then the bleeding stops. But, you know, there are several mechanisms that create the hemorrhoid to, or make the hemorrhoid enlarge in the first place. And that those are reasons, like you were just saying, that you think about like, why did this even happen? But essentially I just described them as cushiony tissue with blood vessels in them. And what about when people want to differentiate internal versus external? Yeah, so there are internal versus external. So there's inside of our anal canal is a line called the dentate line. Above the dentate line, um, you can get hemorrhoids. Those are the internal hemorrhoids. They're further inside. And below the dentate line, you can also, you also have hemorrhoids there. Now, the reason that that's important is that above the dentate line, uh, the nerves that supply that area are not pain fibers. They don't have pain fibers. So that's why internal hemorrhoids bleed, but they generally don't cause a lot of pain. Um, external hemorrhoids, they can also bleed, but really the big symptom for external hemorrhoids is pain. And that's because the nerves that supply external hemorrhoids below the dente line is the same kind of nerves that supplies our skin. So imagine if something on your skin really swelled up, you're feeling that pain. That's the same thing. And there's a lot of nerves down there as anyone that's had a thrombos external hemorrhoid knows when it swells up, the skin stretches, it causes a severe amount of pain. So that's kind of how we differentiate internal versus external. And that's how we, when somebody comes in with symptoms, we can say, oh, this is probably an internal hemorrhoid, or this is probably sounding like an external hemorrhoid. So would you, like, you could see the external ones, but can you, like, would you, to diagnose an internal hemorrhoid, would you palpate or what would you do to be able to know if it's an sure. internal hemorrhoid? Yeah. So if they come in with symptoms, usually it's big enough that yes, you can either palpate it, like put your finger in the anal canal and feel it sometimes. So <clears throat> internal hemorrhoids, we grade one through four. <clears throat> grade one internal hemorrhoid is just a little bit of swelling and it doesn't prolapse out of the anus, meaning it doesn't come out of the anus, right? Um, the grade two, it it's a little bit more swollen it can come out of the anus, prolapse out of the anus, but it goes in on its own. So let's say you have a bowel movement, you feel it's come out, but then you kind of stand up and it's gone away. It's gone back inside. A grade three internal hemorrhoid will prolapse out, let's say with a bowel movement, and you have to use your finger to push it back in. It doesn't go back in on its own. And a grade four prolapses out and it stays out. So a lot of times if people come in with a grade four hemorrhoid, they're like, oh no, it's external because it's outside of their body, but really it's just so big on the inside that it's come all the way out and it's not going back in. So um, depending on the size of it, that's kind of how we can tell if it's internal versus external. Um, if I don't see anything on external exam, my assumption is that it's completely internal and I can usually see that, feel that when I put my finger in. We can also do something called anoscopy, which is where we put a, a short scope on the inside, um, um, an instrument on the inside where we can look at the anal canal and, and, and take a look and see with our own eyes how big they are. And would you say though too, like, let's say, let's say someone's just noticing like blood in the toilet or blood on their toilet paper. And maybe you don't see, maybe you do see something from the outside or you don't. I mean, I know that kind of rates of colorectal cancers are going up. So would you assume that, you know, you obviously, it's not like you're just like, oh, this person has hemorrhoids. Like what, I'm, I'm guessing that there's other investigations to rule out something a bit more sinister. Or yes. will you talk a little bit about that? Because I think there'll be people too that are like, do I have hemorrhoids? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, as I tell people, blood in the stool is never normal. It's not always bad, but it's never normal. Anytime you have blood in the stool, PSA, anytime you have blood in the stool, always get it checked out. Let somebody tell you that it's nothing. It's not a big deal. Right. Um, so um, when blood, uh, when somebody comes in with blood in their stool, I will ask them a series of questions so I can try to figure out the source of that blood. Is it, does it fill the toilet bowl? Is it bright red? Is it, does it just coat the stool? Is it on the toilet paper? Bright red blood tends to me that tends to mean that it's um, the origin of it is from the end of the GI tract or the anal canal, right? The rectum or the anus, um, because it's fresh blood. If people are seeing, let's say, dark blood in their stool, 
or like their stool is black, what they call melina, um, then you worry about bleeding from somewhere further up in the GI tract, higher up in the colon, or even in the upper, it can be in the stomach or the, in the small intestine. So I, tr I try to ask, is it that your stool is really dark? It looks like there's dark old blood or is it bright red blood? Um, so that will kind of give me an indication like, okay, maybe there's something else going on. Pain, pain is another symptom. If they're having constant pain that isn't going away, it's in their pelvis, you know, and they're having bleeding with it. They have weight loss with it, you know, other symptoms that go along with it, that to me would prompt, okay, maybe we need to check this out other than just looking for hemorrhoids. We need to do something like a colonoscopy or a flexible sigmoidoscopy or a CAT scan or something like that. So I look at like a constellation of symptoms. I look at the age of the patient, um, the diet, the diet of the patient, is it high in processed foods? High, you know, if it's, is it a high fiber diet, lots of vegetables and fruits, um, family histories or family history of things like diverticulitis or colon cancer, something that involves the, the colon. Um, and I kind of gather all of that data to determine, okay, this is probably just a hemorrhoid, or this is something that we need to investigate a little bit more. Even things like constipation, straining, bloating, anything that's more than just, oh, I have a little bright red blood and otherwise like, let's say young and healthy 20 something um, that warrants more investigation. And we talk a little bit about, I mean, obviously as a physio who um, people come to me thinking of the pelvic floor right away, um, you know, I'll, I'll be asking questions around like, do you struggle with hemorrhoids? Do you struggle with pain with defecation or pooping? But for you, I don't, I bet you most people aren't coming and thinking of their pelvic floor. Like, what do you, what are you considering when it comes to, and I think, I think it sounds like you're kind of learning a lot as you go, as I don't think in your training, um, the pelvic floor is a big highlight, but what, what would you say now? Like, what are you thinking about as far as muscles or how, how would you describe the pelvic floors related to hemorrhoids? Yeah. So, um, Usually when they're seeing me and we're talking about hemorrhoids, I have to figure out, okay, so um, let me back up. Hemorrhoids are generally um, caused by sitting on the toilet for a long period of time, straining, constipation, scrolling through, you know, Instagram, reading a book, yeah, as a, 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 you know, pre-social pre media, whatever, you know reading something on the toilet, sitting for long periods of time. Hemorrhoids are essentially like varicose veins. When you're like standing up for long, you know, a long day and your legs are kind of heavy at the end of the day because the blood's kind of pooling in, in your legs, same thing with hemorrhoids. So if you're sitting on a toilet for a long period of time, you're straining, you're pushing. Pregnancy, when you're, the, the uterus is kind of sitting on all of those veins where blood is supposed to be returning back to your heart, those can cause hemorrhoids too. So anything that's causing like excess engorgement of those hemorrhoids is what's going to make them swollen. So when it comes to pelvic floor, I will always ask them, like, do you suffer with constipation? Because I can cut out a hemorrhoid, but if I don't fix the constipation, yeah. guess what? You're back here a few months later with another hemorrhoid. So, or some other, some other issue. So I always ask people when they come in with hemorrhoids, do you suffer with constipation? And then I try to tease out what kind of constipation is it just that you're not drinking enough water and fiber? Is it that you're sitting on the toilet and you're straining and pushing and pushing and pushing, which makes it way harder to have a bowel movement? You know, what kind of what kind of constipation are we talking about here? So if I get a patient that tells me like, yeah, I get the urge, but then I sit and I push and I push and I push and I push. I'm like, okay, that almost sounds like, or I'll ask like, does it feel like you're sitting on a ball when you're trying to have a bowel movement? Does it feel like you're pushing against a closed door trying to have a bowel movement? Then I'm like, okay, this sounds like your hemorrhoids are because of straining and your straining is because of your pelvic floor. And then I do an exam to feel their anal sphincter and to feel their pelvic floor. I always ask them to squeeze and to push like they're trying to evacuate my finger. And I can see sometimes they'll push and it's squeezing my finger. And I'm like, okay, this is clearly a pelvic floor issue. The hemorrhoids, yes, are there and we can treat them, but we need to fix the real issue and then we'll fix the symptom of the issue. Yeah. And I think too, like I often describe to 
um, patients that the pelvic floor is like a valve and the valve needs to open when yes. you have a poo and there's a certain amount of reflex where the rectum is helping push the poo down, but yeah. you can have different um, just like, just like if you train your biceps, your biceps get thicker. There's a lot of people that have done, if you ask a lot about their habits growing up, like maybe they I had a girl the other day, actually in her twenties and said, oh my gosh, like I was a germaphobe as a kid. I would not go in a public bathroom. I would not go at school. So lots of holding. So people yes. that have held a lot or hover a lot quite mm -hmm. often have too much tension in, for example, the puborectalis muscle or or the anal sphincter, or yeah. they might have other symptoms like prolapse, mm -hmm. like a, like a rectocele where you can, okay, why, why is there pressure going into the vagina from the rectal tube? Is the outlet too tight? Like, where's this, it's like a backup at the valve. That's going to happen something higher. Quite often yeah. there's incontinence with it. Like I would say very rarely are hemorrhoids their only symptom when yeah. you ask about the pelvic floor and it's like, cause so many of the pelvic floor issues I say are pressure issues. Like there's too yeah. much pressure. Um, and so you're seeing the result, whether it be prolapse or hemorrhoids or incontinence and quite often a combination, right? Right. And then they come to see you because then that that's like their main issue because they're bleeding, let's say, or yeah. they're painful. And it's like, well, no, this is truly a symptom. Like you're just physically seeing it, but you can't see the pelvic floor or what's happening. And so that's why that wasn't maybe your first stop you know, to, to get yeah. treatment. And it's such a reflexive muscle that we're not meant to think about. And so it's quite often our habits or our nervous system or the way we do things that influence it that then cause the symptom, but it's normal for people to not be able to conceptualize their pelvic floor. <laughs> so I think that can be really hard for people. Oh, what, wait a minute. Like I'm not doing anything with my pelvic floor. Yeah. Not intentionally. Right. 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 Yeah. Right. Exactly. What's yeah. the difference then between hemorrhoids and anal fissures? Because sometimes I think people will present similarly, right? Just pain. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people think they have hemorrhoids when they have anal fissures. Yes. Well, so um, a multitude of reasons for that. So any kind of bleeding and anal pain, everything that gets sent to me, if it's bleeding and anal pain is a hemorrhoid period, like that's, that's mm -hmm. what the diagnosis is for evaluation, but it can turn out to be a lot of different things. Anytime somebody has severe pain with defecation and bleeding that stops, the bleeding stops and the pain goes away maybe like 10 minutes later once they've kind of recovered from the bowel movement, that's like a clear cut sign, almost a clear cut sign of a fissure. Hemorrhoidal bleeding tends to be painless bleeding. So if somebody comes and they're like, yeah, I just bleed a ton, but no, there's no pain or anything like that, then, then my mind goes more towards this is probably a hemorrhoid. So to describe a fissure, what I tell people is that a fissure is essentially like a paper cut on the skin of your anus, right? Imagine how painful a paper cut is. <laughs> That's essentially what it is on the skin of your anus. And the reason for anal fissures um, most commonly is that this anal sphincter muscle is too tight. And you're having this like paradoxical contraction when it should be relaxing and it's ripping open that skin. And they're usually in the posterior midline or in the, on the back side of the anus. Um, and the reason for that is because the blood supply to the anus, it essentially, they have, um, for lack of a better term, less blood supply to that part of the anus, right? And so that's where the skin tends to break down. And that's why the fissures usually end up in the backside of the anus. But textbook for somebody that comes in and says, I have severe pain with bowel movements. I have bleeding um, and I have maybe some constipation or I have firm bowel movements. That to me sounds like a fissure. Whereas a hemorrhoid will tend to present with painless bleeding, even if they do have constipation. And so if when someone comes in with a fissure too, I automatically think of a pel the pelvic floor because again, with the valve analogy um, and um, like there's so many, well, there's, I always show, I have pelvic models and I'll show like the circular pelvic floor muscle mm -hmm. around the anus and then how it attaches to the tailbone and all the other muscles that come off of, for example, the perineum and come back to the tailbone. And when people mm -hmm. see it, they're like, oh my God, I like sit all day for work and I totally sit in this like, 
cr- yeah. crouchy style and I can see that I'm like tightening that muscle all day right. or like once you start to look at like what do you do for a living what do you do for sports mm-hmm. um, all that stuff people start to sometimes put it together like oh my gosh I think I tighten that valve constantly yeah. right yeah yeah and sometimes all they need is just recognition of that yes. and then add some fiber and some water to soften up the stool and then they they can get better sometimes just with that alone yes so then what um so typical presentation i guess would be people would come to you i think when you say i have you know the referral so correct me if i'm wrong i think this is what would happen in canada is that someone would have these persistent symptoms they would present to their family doctor um the family doctor might try to provide some suggestions, but then I think sometimes a quick referral to someone like yourself. Would you say that's kind of a typical presentation? Yeah, that's pretty typical. I mean, usually what they'll do is um, give, it's usually like a cream, like you said, um, and then they'll have them come back and see if it's better. If it's better, they, and and the patient isn't bothered by it, they may not send a referral. If uh, it's not better then usually once they're kind of past that first step, then yeah, they'll, they'll send a referral for hemorrhoids or rectal bleeding. So then would you say, kind of, we've already talked a little bit, so they come to you, they've had this mm-hmm. referral, um, you know, you spend some time educating them a little bit about what it is. You might do some different diagnostic tests to kind of rule out anything sinister. And then what would you say, um, I th- I think, you know, we're starting to get better at pro- providing almost like a menu of options. Right. Um, what, what, tell me a little bit about like, so if someone's listening and they're wondering what to expect, like, what do you think, where would you start? I know it totally depends on the person, but um, what are some of the things that you would start with suggesting before you think about surgery? Yeah. So the first thing is we have to treat the constipation. If there's constipation, we have to treat it. If it's pelvic outlet dysfunction, it's pelvic floor physical therapy to get those muscles to help you have a bowel movement and you're not, you know, force, you're not sitting and straining. Right. So we have to figure out the source of the hemorrhoids and treat that first. And, you know, and then sometimes they're not as bothered by the hemorrhoids. So sometimes that's all they need. Sometimes, uh, you know, if, if, it doesn't sound like it's a, you know, like a pelvic floor, like this inert, like the muscles aren't really working well together. If their exam is, you know, they're relaxing their pelvic floor and their anus appropriately on my exam, then it's usually maybe like a fiber water type of situation. Sometimes we can give like a hydrocortisone cream or suppository. Um, if they're grade one, grade two, that can sometimes help shrink down the hemorrhoidal column so that um, they don't have the bleeding anymore. Um, if they've tried that and that doesn't work, um, and it doesn't seem like something more nefarious, like a cancer or something else, um, then, um, you know, then I, I really kind of go by their symptoms. Like how Mm -hmm. much is this really bothering you? And they'll be like, you know, when I do take the fiber in the water, like, I just forget to do it. And when I do take it, like it really helps. And I don't, and so I'm like, so then it's just like, you know, let's just re-education and whatever. And, you know, I tell them, the surgery is really easy for me. It's a great, easy surgery for me. The recovery is what's hard. So I don't want to suggest a surgery to you until you tell me your symptoms are so unbearable and you've tried everything else that you are willing to undergo the pain that it takes um, after having this surgery. Now you get people that come in that have, that have really bad hemorrhoids. They'll have maybe an internal and external component and it's just massive, right? It's, it's kind of, created a life of its own. Those are never going to get better without surgery. If they have constipation, I still try to treat their constipation because afterwards I don't want you sitting and straining, but like there are certain ones where it's like, you're beyond where medication is going to fix this. If there's like a, if they're so big that there's a hygiene problem, they can't clean around it. Um, and that's causing their itching or something like that. Then it's like, well, we have to take care of that. This problem has gotten so bad. We have to take care of this, but we also need to work on these other things. So I essentially look at what their symptoms are, um, you know, what type of hemorrhoid they have. And um, if they're small, have we ruled out, you know, conservative measures aren't working. Is it a pelvic floor and outlet, outlet dysfunction situation? Do we need to fix that? Um, and then if it's way too big or you've tried everything else and it doesn't work, then that's when we start talking about surgery. And I think it's important, like when you were talking, um, cause you're talking about like, are they relaxing their pelvic floor? Is there, you know, a paradoxical meaning just kind of, um, um, 
it's tightening when it's supposed to be relaxing type of movement. So I think everybody lumps pelvic floor physio in with Kegels and that that's all we teach yeah. is like tightening, tightening. And I, so I think that's confusing for some people to understand that we don't just teach you how to tighten your muscles. This might be a situation where you need to learn more how to do the opposite and no two people the same. And that's what we look at in our assessment is what are they actually doing? Cause no one has the same habits, but through their description. And like I said, you know, what sports are they doing? What's their work? Um, what are their habits? How do they stand? How do they sit? How do they push uh, all that yeah. stuff? Like it's a, co it's usually how I would describe a coordination issue. And yes. so, um, like I said, the pelvic floor is not a muscle we're used to thinking about. So quite often, you know, how I would start with people is like education and then always like almost mindfulness around this is what it feels yeah. like to tighten this yeah. is what it feels like to relax I usually give them an exercise like that and a lot of just mindfulness around now I want you to notice your habits now that you can feel what this feels like to tighten and I might use my finger as feedback whether it be in their anus or in their vagina yeah. or or not at all if they just want visuals from the outside but usually an element of awareness and then start to notice your habits for example on the toilet and some people are like oh my god I am like tightening yeah. I had no idea that the way yeah. I poo um, yeah. I tighten and so it's it's very much an individual a thing for people yeah and um and I think that's where a lot of people are like oh my gosh I've learned so much just around pushing a baby out, um, letting my pee out, yeah. keeping the valve open so they don't feel so much pain, all of that stuff. Yeah. Rita, yeah. how often do you just um, find yourself prescribing, like, let's say for the menopausal women, the perimenopausal, menopausal, postpartum woman, like, how often do you prescribe estrogen? Because you see sometimes these people just have frail tissues. Um, and how often is that the source of pain? Um, you know what, that's like a really, really good question. And it is way outside of my scope of, of knowledge. Um, although as I'm kind of diving more into this, there are um, several urologists, Dr. Rachel Rubin is one of them. She's a big activist um, for sexual health. And, you know, as I'm learning more about this, it's all very related um, uh, to add another specialty into our multi uh, multidisciplinary pelvic floor situation. But um, I never prescribe estrogen. And I do believe that that is outside of my scope um, because um, urologists and um, gynecologists are generally the ones that are prescribing the hormones. Is it something that I would be up for learning about? Absolutely. Because I do think knowledge about how this all works together is, is really important. Um, I'm still on that journey, but I I do not know enough to be the one to um, to prescribe estrogen personally. Um, if somebody comes in and they're also talking about things like painful sex or recurrent UTIs, um, things like that, then I'm like, well, maybe this is a this is a hormone situation, and so I will refer out for that. Um, but I I do feel that. In learning more about it, I am more attuned to those complaints um, and um, at least knowing enough that I don't know it and I need to send you to somebody who can help you with that. I wonder if it is. I mean, right now you feel like it's a, outside of your scope of practice, but I wonder if it really is. Like there's so many estrogen receptors in and around the anus too, right? And you're oh. an anus specialist. <laughs> Like, I think like, I, I appreciate that we're all like lifelong learners and we can't yes. know everything. And I, yeah, it'd be interesting to see like yeah. where that takes you. Right. Well, I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to look that up. So, I mean, we don't, you had asked me before we started recording, like how much of this in our training do we get? I mean, yeah. nothing about estrogen zero. This is the first time it's ever actually been brought up to me, period. Yeah. Um, so that's to tell you that, but as far as like pelvic floor related, it really kind of depends on where you train, where I trained, there was almost nothing, um, places like Boston and uh, Michigan, they have like the pelvic floor centers where colorectal surgeons, urogynecologists, urologists are all very much involved in running those centers. Um, there's not one like that. Uh, there's maybe one like that in Houston. Um, but the one I'm thinking of in Boston is um, very much headed by one of the colorectal surgeons. I didn't get trained at that center. So my training has been self self taught, and it's really kind of just based on interest. And I think, you know, you brought up menopause and perimenopause. 
a lot of um, my colleagues in the gynecology and urology fields were like, we were taught nothing about that in residency, a gynecologist. And it's like that entire population of people was essentially completely ignored. And so there's a lot of people actually my generation that are doing a lot of self-learning um, and now teaching about perimenopause and menopause and that we don't just like ignore it and say stick, stick your head in a, in a freezer, you know, if you're having a hot flash, like there are ways that we can treat women that are going through these processes. So there's a lot of learning to do on our part as well. So I appreciate you bringing that up actually. Well, such a huge part of the population is 50% of the population goes through this yeah. and it's, so it's crazy, but I think like we, there's like this surge of information. So it just makes me curious. Yeah. Yeah. I always like to use the um, parallel to orthopedics because I think everyone understands the orthopedic world a little bit e more easily, we'll say. So for example, someone has knee pain, um, which is my, like the similarity here is like fissures or um, hemorrhoids to the knee pain. It's the symptom. Not many people would go straight to thinking they need surgery. Like I think everybody knows that surgery is a little bit farther towards the end of the continuum. Mm -hmm. But like you said, um, sometimes you can look at someone and be like, this one needs surgery. Like I'm going to go straight there. You've yeah. described how at the beginning of the continuum for something like fissures or hemorrhoids is um, some of the conservative things like creams, physio, um, constipation management. So let's say you've tried those things. Someone comes in, you're like, I'm going to start with the conservative options. I'm going to recommend. And let's say they come back and like, oh, okay, I've learned something along the way, but I still have these symptoms. Can you talk about the options? Like, I want to know a little bit about Botox and if you ever use that and then other surgical options. Yeah. So I'll start with talking about hemorrhoids. So if it is an internal only hemorrhoid, meaning the hemorrhoid that is supplied with nerve fibers that are not pain fibers, an option for them is rubber banding, right? So essentially you get a tight rubber band, you put it at the base, you can do this in the office because it's not, pain, it's not comfortable, but it's not painful. So you put the scope in, um, you isolate where that hemorrhoid is, and you put a, a tight rubber band at the base of the hemorrhoid. It doesn't cause pain. It causes a little bit of pressure. Like you feel like, do I have to poop now? Um, and, and after five to seven days, it kind of chokes off the blood supply to that hemorrhoid and it falls off and scars in. Now that's a nice, um, it's a, it's a nice middle ground between the conservative measures and um, surgery. One, because they don't have pain. Um, two, that you can get rid of the, some of that hemorrhoidal tissue. And so it can relieve the bleeding. But if you don't treat the upstream, like the constipation or the reasons why they got it, then you're just setting yourself for uh, you're setting yourself up for more bandings down the line or or surgery. So that that that's one option that's somewhere in between. If there is an external component, so something called a mixed hemorrhoid is a hemorrhoid that has both an internal and an external component. If that hemorrhoid is the one that's symptomatic and you've tried all the conservative measures, if there's an external component, there's really no no option other than surgery because it is you can't you can't put a rubber band on it <laughs> that that would be excruciatingly painful you'd never ever band external hemorrhoids never ever ever mm -hmm. band external hemorrhoids so that person has to go to sleep you put numbing medicine in there you cut it out and and that's how they get rid of the external hemorrhoid is by cutting it out surgery is kind of the only option for that um for, uh, and then there are lots of other options that people will do for internal hemorrhoids that I, I kind of, I kind of have like a few things that I like to do that I know work. Um, and I haven't tried all the other kind of things that people do. They can do infrared coagulation where they're essentially kind of like clotting off all of the blood vessels in the hemorrhoidal column so that then it shrinks down. Um, there's one called, um, THD, it's like transanal, um, hem, I don't know, it's like hemorrhoidal dearterialization. Anyway, essentially what they do is you take a stitch and you kind of stitch the hemorrhoid and then kind of like pexy it up further into the rectum so it doesn't prolapse out. And essentially you're cutting off the blood supply to the to the hemorrhoid. Um, I don't do that one. I know people that do a lot of them. Um, that one tends to have less pain, um, but you're not taking away the hemorrhoid. You're kind of just um, tightening it up. And then um, let me see what other, uh, there are a few other options that I don't, I don't really do. So I, I don't want to really speak on them because I'm not really the expert on them. Um, when it comes to fissures, 
Those are treated very, very differently than hepatocytes. <clears throat> Um, a fissure is usually due to a tight muscle. And sometimes I actually will have um, a pelvic floor physical therapist send me them because they cannot get the most out of the pelvic floor physical therapy because it's so tight and so painful that they kind of need that muscle to relax, like chemically relax, and so that they can go back and get the physical therapy without so much pain. So essentially what we do for a fissure, the first thing we do is give people a cream that has a medication in it that relaxes the muscle of the sphincter. Um, now, uh, in acute small fissures, so um, fissures that have not been there for a long period of time that are kind of small, oftentimes this will work. The nifedipine uh, cream is one of them. Diltiazem is the name of another one. You can give them, in addition with the fiber and the water, sometimes that will treat the fissure, close that skin. If that doesn't work, the next step up is Botox. So we need that muscle to really kind of loosen to, you know, weaken a little bit so that the fissure can heal over. So we Botox it. You, everybody kind of knows what Botox is when it comes to like cosmetics. So it deadens the muscle. So essentially we do the same thing with the internal sphincter. We deaden the muscle. It's usually not enough that people are incontinent, meaning that they now can't hold the stool in. That's a very rare um, side effect of the Botox. But again, the Botox is temporary. So if you do have the incontinence, it will tend to go away in about three to four months, usually less than that. Um, but usually it's enough time that that fissure can heal up. It's like a 95% heal rate with the Botox. After that, if the medicine didn't work, the Botox didn't work, and you're still having severe pain, um, then we start talking about surgery where we cut the muscle. It's called a sphincterotomy, which is where we go in and we cut uh, two thirds of the internal sphincter on one side. I know. And so we leave some intact and sometimes that's what it takes if the fissure's chronic and like there's nothing else that is working, then we do a sphincterotomy. And that one has a near 100% um, uh, heal rate. If something doesn't heal after that, then you need to worry like this fissure is being caused by something else. Is it Crohn's disease? Is it HIV? Is it an STD? Is it syphilis? Is it, um, uh, it could be tuberculosis. It could be a lot of like random systemic things that are causing this fissure as a cancer. So if you've done all those things and you're still not healing, then you have to worry that it's something else systemic is going on. But that's essentially the algorithm for treating an anal fissure. And I think too, like, sometimes I'm getting confused what we talked about before we hit record. And now is that you also mentioned before we started talking here that um, like, I think about, you know, you want to help your patients. And sometimes like, if you don't deal with the upstream problems, it's mm -hmm. like your success rates won't be as high, right? It's like, no. I'm, I'm fixing the immediate problem, but like, where, where did this come from? And you were talking a little bit about how, you know, starting to get like younger and younger people, especially you can just feel the stress coming off of them. I have a lot of those ones. And so again, I, as a physio, I'm always thinking like, Hey, why do they even have these problems? So I ask a lot about what's going, what does your life look like? Do you yeah. have kids? What do you do for work? Is your job stressful? I ask things like, talk to me about stress. And I always say, please, everybody has stress, but right now, would you say this is kind of a normal good time for you? Or are you going through a lot right now? And you were kind of mentioning too, that you'll have a lot of patients that just like start crying almost when they talk mm -hmm. about that. And it's really opened your mind to, wow, maybe my patient needs a counselor more than they need a surgery, <laughs> yes. right? Yes, absolutely. And I'm, you know, I'm always there to kind of help treat the physical aspect. If, if there's something that I can do to kind of put a bandaid on that while the, you know, to, to relieve them of their symptoms, while they're dealing with the upstream things then. Um, but I think it takes the desire to want to delve into that, um, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, we all live stressful lives, as you said. And sometimes when people are like, reduce your stress, well, like, duh, if I could reduce my stress, like I would do that if it was that easy. But so sometimes it's giving um, uh, uh, attainable stress reducing, you know, modalities. Sometimes it's like they didn't realize it until they came to see you for their fissure. Like, oh, damn, I do need to talk to a therapist or I do, I should do this. Or maybe my job is so stressful that now it's like physically hurting me. Maybe it's time to move on from that. You know, so it kind of like you said, like brings awareness to that. But then I've had a patient that was like, oh, he was having like both penile and um, anal sphincter issues. 
And he was like, you know, I went for a run the other day and everything got better. And I was like, do more of that, <laughs> do more of that. Like mm-hmm. it's relieving stress and that's why it felt better. So, and, and I, and I sometimes have to tell them like, I'm not like some witch doctor. I promise you that this is probably stress related. And yes, you do have a physical problem, but this is a physical manifestation of like maybe your mental health status right now. And so we need to work on that while also trying to mitigate the symptoms that you're having of this. So I recommend meditation a lot if people are religious and like prayer or something they want to do. I'm like, maybe do a little bit more of that. Take 10 minutes of your day and go take a walk and like do some deep breathing. If you can exercise, do that. Um, You know, things that you know, a lot of times I'll tell them like before you had this job or before you had kids, what were the things that you used to do that you really liked doing? Because people forget. I can say that from personal experience. What are the things that you used to do that you really like doing? Okay, try to do that once a week or like find a time to do that. Mm-hmm. And that can help reduce some stress too. So I I kind of get in there with like <laughs> their personal lives, but I'm like, oh yeah, also here's some like lidocaine to like help with the symptom yes. while you're dealing with the problem. Yeah, absolutely. I think I can think of two p- patients off the top of my head in the last month or so that, um, you know, hemorrhoid related problems. One of them, um, I could tell, like, obviously, like I looked around the anus and treated the pelvic floor initially to give her some symptom relief, but really quickly I could figure, okay, what is this girl doing? And the, I, we came to the conclusion, like in the way that she exercises, a lot of hit training and running, Uh um, the, in the exercises I was getting her to do, she's like, oh yeah, I'm totally tightening my anus. Whenever I exert myself in a crunch or I lift something heavy, my anus tightens first. She's like, I can tell that's a really bossy strategy. So we had to kind of figure out a way to think about exercise in a different way and find a different area to find strength. Another lady, um, was going through a lot of counseling and a messy divorce a lot of pain um, from the divorce. And she said, uh, like a lot of emotional abuse. And she said, I have this problem with holding down Mm -hmm. there. And so she said, as we started talking, she's like, oh my God, that's why I have hemorrhoids. And and they they can often put it together once you explain how the body's connected and and, and sometimes you're getting those symptoms, not because of anything you're doing wrong per se, but sometimes they they're appreciative to hear it's part of a bigger picture, right? Right, right, yes. I'm going to totally flip gears and ask you one last question because I don't sure. feel like we did this justice yet. Itchy <laughs> anus. Yes. Um, a lot of times people with hemorrhoids and fissures have an itchy anus and it just drives them crazy. Oh, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about why that symptom might come from either having hemorrhoids or fissures? Yeah, so for hemorrhoids, sometimes it's like a hygiene thing, like where you're not like, you're not able to wipe well enough, especially if you've got external or you have skin tags affiliated with it. You're not, you feel like you're not getting clean enough because of just the anatomy of what's down there. Um, and then that will um, lead people to use baby wipes. 95% of patients I see that are like, I have an itchy butt. I'm like, and are you using baby wipes? They're like, oh yeah. And they're like very proud, like because nobody told them. And they're like, yeah, right. I bring them with me everywhere. And I'm like, mm, that may be part of it. You know, there's soap that's left on there. Like our perianal area has like special oils to keep it like lubricated and soft. And so when you're wiping that away and it's drying out and you're leaving whatever the soap residue that's on there, they can get, get like a contact dermatitis. Um, just essentially like inflammation of the skin around there from all the soap that's there, but then it's more itchy. And so they're like, um, okay, it's not clean because it's itchy. And we use more and more and more and more and more and more of the wipes. And so it becomes, it's like, (laughs) and so that's, that can be part of it. So anybody with an itchy bottom, I always ask them, are you using baby wipes? And they'll even say, oh, there's all natural one or unscented one. And it it, honestly, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like it, it, it causes sort of that dermatitis and that reaction. So that's, that's one thing I always ask. Um, the other thing is if they aren't able to get clean and stool is sitting there on your skin, that is very, very, very irritating. Um, and so that, that that can be why it's not truly the hemorrhoid that's itching. It's the fact that you may have some residual stool or something else on there that wasn't fully cleaned off. Um, anal fissures. The reason why people will sometimes have, um, itchiness is because, so the skin is open and whenever there's like an injury anywhere, your body will send fluid 
inflammatory cells there to go fix the problem and it comes in the form of fluid. And so if that fluid is just sitting on your perianal skin the entire time, it can become very, very irritating and itchy. And so it's essentially like, um, I don't know, you just have this kind of inflammatory fluid sitting on your skin in a very sensitive area and that can cause itching. And then maybe the baby wipes come in <laughs> to help treat that. So um, what I do is I try to figure out the source of the itching. Sometimes we can't find a source, we don't know, but um, we try to find a source of the itching. If it's a baby wipes, we cut out the baby wipes and we just say clean paper towel with either water or um, a hand towel or something with water. Bidets, I love bidets in America. It's not really like a thing, but like in Europe, they use bidets everywhere. So, but they have this thing called the tushy. It's my favorite one. Um, but essentially you just take it and you um, um, attach it to your toilet. You can attach it to any toilet and that's the best way you can clean yourself. And so I, I tell them like, maybe that's where um, that, you know, try that. Um, and then there are certain, there's like this stuff here called balneal. I don't know if you guys have it there, but it's essentially like a perineal cleanser. It's like a lotion cleanser that you can use on the anal area. That's very gentle. Um, and it's for the perineum in the perineal area. And then um, something here called calmoceptine, which is um, a skin protectant for that area as well. So I'll start with stop the baby wipes, try the balneal for cleansing the bidet and try the calmoceptine so that any, any um, fluid that may be coming out either from the fissure um, or something else, it's not touching the skin so you don't get that irritation there. So the important thing is figuring out the source of it and then figuring out what they're trying to do about it and then just kind of retraining habits with things that aren't going to be as irritating. And I'd be curious as you start doing a deep dive into estrogen too, like if, especially in that population that might be most affected, like, because it sometimes like that's how people will sometimes feel in their vulva vaginal area too, is like itchy, dry, irritated. I'd be yep. curious to know too, like with, with the estrogen receptors around the anus, like how much is it estrogen deficiency? I, who knows? Like it's always trial and error, but I'd be curious with some of that population, like what happens? I don't know. You see, you got me, you got me something on my list of things to learn. So mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. I that. And I think that, um, cause as a physio, I can't prescribe estrogen either. I would, what I would do if I looked at the tissue and it looked frail or maybe pale, or maybe some of those same symptoms were up in the vulvo vaginal area, I would probably send a note to either their gynecologist, the urologist, whoever's following them or their family doctor, just saying, Query, what are your thoughts on estrogen therapy? Because I can't prescribe it and I'm not the expert either, but I'll just, because I think sometimes it's like, oh, well, that's an idea. Maybe we could try that. It's, yeah, yeah. I always tell people healthcare is trial and error in so many ways, isn't it? Yes. And I love getting other people's um, take on it too, because it's like they're seeing it from a different perspective and a different lens. And so, oh. If it's something like, hey, can you see if this person's a candidate for Botox or a candidate for, you know, this or that or whatever, like I, I, I'm open to it, especially when you're able to take all that time to spend with the patient. It's, it's nice to, to sort of just have that suggestion and that perspective when being referred to patient. Well, I think, I think patients are lucky to have you. And I think anyone that comes to see you would be really feel really refreshed that you're looking at them from the big picture and asking a lot of these questions and also just being open to be like, Oh, tell me more. And I'm going to learn more about that. I think I find it really refreshing. And so I appreciate your time today. Um, will you tell everybody about where to find you? I'm obviously going to link anything in the show notes too, but is there anything that you want to direct people to? Sure. So, I mean, right now I'm on, well, while TikTok is still up in the United States, <laughs> I do have a TikTok and, a, and an Instagram. It's my first name, last name, MD, Rita Belazer, MD, um, for both of those handles. Um, my website, my, my business name is Houston Community Surgical. So my website is um, www.houstoncommunitysurgical.com. Um, and they can message me from the website or from any of those social media platforms. I'm in Houston, Texas. I'm located in a neighborhood called The Heights. Um, I have a license to practice medicine in Texas and I do offer telehealth. Um, but outside of Texas, it would mainly just be kind of like coaching slash consulting, um, uh, which um, I'm happy to do and starting to get going as I've talked to some other uh, physiotherapists that are like, I really just wish 
wish you could talk to my patient and tell them what options are out there, you know, without providing like a diagnosis. Um, so I'm going to start doing some of that too, um, just so I can have a little bit more reach even outside of Texas. Well, I appreciate you and all you're doing. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. And thank you for having me. This has been an awesome conversation and I appreciate you talking about the estrogen. I'm excited to look it up and learn more. Cool. <laughs>